Revelation, chapter 15. <clears throat> Unfailingly, follows chapter 14. <clears throat> and we read, Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and amazing, seven angels with seven plagues, which are the lambs, for with them the wrath of God is finished. Now we've seen this term sign uh, three times now. Uh, we saw it in chapter 12, verse 1, it talked about the great sign of the woman. A few verses later we see it again mentioned, verse 3, another sign appeared in heaven, this was the dragon. And now we see the sign mentioned a third time. And of course this is the seven plagues. <clears throat> so we're tied into an ongoing story. Uh, and we'll continue to see that as this un, uh, develops. We have looked at sevens before. Seven seals. And then we looked at uh, seven trumpets. Uh, interestingly, although it's not mentioned by name, there was another seven. Uh, there is the woman in ver uh, verse 12. There is the dragon who's thrown down to the earth. There is the first beast, or the beast up out of the sea. There is the, se uh, the second beast, or the false prophet. There is the 144,000 that follows that. There is the uh, three angels with three messages that follow that. And then there is the harvest of the earth which follow that. So between the trumpets and these bowls, these last seven plagues, we actually had seven stories that the author of the book of Revelation shared with us. And uh, I, although it's not mentioned as a group of seven, I still nevertheless in some degree wonder, is this not an intentional style? For, all, for instance, uh, John, who wrote the Gospel of John, there develops his whole Gospel around seven uh, signs. And so John is really hung up on seven. <laughs> you know? And there's a lot of them here in the book of Revelation. It talks about that these seven plagues are the last, for with them the wrath of God is finished. That tells us that the book of Revelation is beginning to wind down. We're beginning to uh, look at conclusions. And as we look at conclusions, we'll notice something about those conclusions. They get increasingly elaborate. At the beginning of the book, when we ended the seven uh, seals, there was sort of a rather brief conclusion with a brief and almost esoteric picture of eternity. When we ended the seven uh, trumpets, it was a little bit more explicit, a little bit more detailed. Remember when we just entered these, uh, these seven uh, incidents of personages of, that I uh, just mentioned to you in chapter 14, uh, the harvest of the earth, that was rather detailed and rather specific in terms of uh, a heavenly scene and an eternal scene. Now we'll find as we move forward that these heavenly scenes, these uh, pictures of eternity, become even more detailed and explicit. It's if John has been focusing on the present, but as he works through the book, he is increasingly taking us into the eternal present uh, and, and beyond that into eternity itself. And for, in fact, it gets a little difficult sometimes to distinguish what is the eternal present that he might be talking about or simply talking about eternity at that point in time. Not easy to distinguish sometimes. But he does tell us that these are the last of the plagues. And then these, the wrath of God is finished. That is, he will have fully 
accomplish his goal and purpose in judging uh, Israel. And it will be done. It will be complete. The city and the nation will be destroyed. The survivors will be taken as slaves off into the Roman Empire. And uh, the country and the city and the temple level. It will be all over. Feel free to ask questions now as we go. And I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire. And also those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name, standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands. Now we were introduced to a sea of glass in chapter 4, verse 5, which was a heavenly throne room scene. And now this is the second time we come to a sea of glass. Now let's talk about sea a bit. We know that in front of the temple, there was a quote-unquote sea. This happened to be a very large bronze or brass bowl that would hold uh, thousands of gallons of water. And from this sea, the priest would go to get water so they could wash the sacrificial animals and they could wash themselves. To a large degree, a lot of these priests were, were today we would actually call butchers. Their job was to take the animal, you know, cut its throat, bleed it out, and collect some of the blood, cast it on, on the side of the altar, and then process the animal, skin it, and process the pieces to be put on the altar as burnt offering, or many of those pieces to give them back to the person who brought the offering, because the, in the uh, Bible, they participated through a feast in, in the worship service uh, in this way. Now, this great brass container of several, what do you call, baths of water is called the sea. But it all, it's not, as I was studying this, it struck me, why was it called a sea? Because, you know, the symbolism of the word doesn't really fit, in some sense, with temple or tabernacle worship. There, it, there's no C associated with that. Now, I grant you that Solomon's uh, collection of water was large, but large as it may be, C as a word still didn't quite seem to fit. And yet, obviously, it does fit there, fits here in the book of Revelation. So the question is, why? In Old Testament scripture, as well as Old Testament lore, as well as pagan traditions and such like, the sea had a specific uh, connotation to that. The sea was where the dragon lived in the depths of the deep. This, the sea was agitated by the dragon and it was constantly foaming and it was constantly beating against the rocks and it was where the ancients uh, thought and, and, and uh, envisioned you might say the great enemy of humanity, Satan as we had called him, lived in the depths of the sea. And we see this to some degree in the book of Job, which also talks about things of this nature. We see it in the creation story to some degree with the separation of the uh, land from the sea. And although I'm not going to give you the massive amounts of detail uh, today that can be shared with you about this uh, dragon and uh, the sea being his you know, place of uh, security, and the place where he would live in the depths of the ocean and the darkness of those depths. This, in fact, is an underlying theme through pagan and uh, Old Testament worship. <clears throat> and that I believe we have this uh, use of sea by Solomon and others as a reflection of that. Whereas 
as the sea was used by Satan for his purposes, uh, this uh, glassy surface of Solomon's sea, uh, without the agitation of uh, the dragon in its depths, and that water being used for holy purposes in the sacrificial system, the cleansing of the priests and the offerings and such like, we have a, 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 uh, a picture of the sea being redeemed from its evil purposes and being used for holy purposes. And the use of sea in the Old Testament, I think, has this implication, and it's almost out of context application here, giving it a, 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 an implication of what I've just been describing. In fact, I don't, I'm not sure it would be much of an implication to an ancient who is so associated with his and his mental processes with the sea being a place where Satan dwelt in its depths and the agitation of the sea being symbolic of his evil hab habitation, that the use of the word sea and the sacrifice, I think, would have been more easily grasped for them to see uh, in their own mind how God had conquered that enemy and that the sea was no longer agitated, but it was quiet. And this waters were no longer for evil purposes, but having been conquered by God were for purposes of purity. And then we see that transformed into a heavenly uh, glass sea uh, bef uh, before the throne in heaven. In fact, as you study the throne room scene in the book of Revelation, one thing you don't see is land. You know, or earth. Or dirt, or anything like that. You say sea in heaven, a glass sea with a hard surface. So I say, well, uh, crystal surface. The implication being the sea is no longer the, uh, the habitation of Satan. He no longer controls that. He's no longer lord over that. He's no longer agitating there and hiding from judgment. But God is now lord of the sea. And so you see in Revelation 4, this crystalline sea before the throne. Now we see it again in chapter 15. And also, while, uh, and there's two other things I'm going to draw to your attention here. I'm, I'm hoping they're going to fit in your mind. One, I'd like you to remember that Moses had a little encounter with the sea, if you may remember. And that particular sea did something unique at his command, command of God. It congealed into a hard surface, so to speak. And it was agitating, at, uh, as uh, Moses and the children of Israel approached it, and with the uh, command of God, it separated and became solid. And Moses and the children of Israel passed through it, and then it came back and destroyed the Egyptians. And then what did Moses do? He sang a song. If you remember, the song of Moses initially and originally took place by the sea after God had used the sea, which typically would be using something evil, and he had calmed the sea, he had stilled the sea, and he had ejected from the sea the sources of evil, and he had made that into a solid body of water, quiet, for the passing of his people. And now we have another sea that's solid, quiet, and standing beside it, or what? The people of God who passed through the sea, the sea, in this case, with mingled with fire, who passed through the tribulation. And now they also stand on the sea, or by the sea, singing the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. 
the song of victory. They also have conquered uh, Rahab, I think was the name of the ancient dragon that uh, given, the name given to this one who inhabited the depths of the sea. And they are conquerors and singing uh, a, a song and the, the quietness of the sea, the crystalline hardness of the sea, giving testimony to the fact no longer inhabited by that one who would agitate its waters. Now I would draw your attention to one other. One who spoke, and the winds and the waves ceased, and the water became solid to his feet. As he walked out upon that, those, that sea, and demonstrating, I think, to a Jewish ear, that here's somebody who had conquered Rahab, who had conquered that beast of the sea, and demonstrated by putting him under his feet as he walked on a solid and quiet surface. And not only that, called his people to do the same thing that he calls Peter out to walk on that solid surface as well. And then not only has he experienced victory over uh, the devil and his habitation, but the church will as well. As in so many cases, Peter symbolizing in the early years of the, of the behavior of the church. I'm giving you some contacts that I'm hoping is registering with you because the book of Revelation is just a book of symbols. And if you read these symbols, the sea and the fire and this and that, as, and just as words, and you just keep on going, and you don't ask yourself, why are these strange words here? Why are these, stra these strange symbols here? What do they have to do with Israel or the church? What is the history of, thing, of these words? Do they, have any, do they go back into lore, uh, Hebrew or pagan lore, or to the, the scriptures, to the Old Testament, New Testament? And when you begin to ask those questions, which is my job to ask them as I study these week, they become more than vocabulary words that you pass on to the next vocabulary word. They become incidents in the religious history or symbols in the religious history of Israel that have meaning and have had meaning for a thousand or more years. And now they're brought to our attention again in the book of Revelation of French. And do we ignore that history? Do we ignore the fact that Moses solidified that sea? Do we ignore the fact that the enemies of uh, Israel were envisioned as being dra dragons <coughs> that did leave, live in the depths of the sea? Do we ignore the fact that Christ conquered that very enemy uh, symbolically by walking on that sea? I think, no, we take note of that and recognize that here is a picture of God's people having gone through that fiery sea, that, that place where Satan reigns. And in fact, it turns out he is conquered. And the church stands beside that still body of water, demonstrating still as they stand there in some degree what they just pass through with that fire we see, that new element of fire. But, but they are standing there safe, having weathered the storm, conquered the enemy, as Moses did, as Jesus did, and there before the throne, they stand victorious over a defeated enemy. Symbolism. Your thoughts? On that. Um, of course, we, we found fire. Fire is not always mentioned as judgment, although the predominance perhaps is. Remember, we have hell itself, the lake of fire. And we have in the last chapter the mention of fire, the symbols of judgment. That's probably what this 
refers to here. But fire is also used as a symbol of the purity of God, burning away the chaff. And, and, and nothing that offends can enter the presence of God in the fire, sort of symbolically demonstrating that. And before the uh, throne, we have uh, in uh, Revelation 4 or 5, From the throne came flashes of lightnings and rumblings and peals of thunder, and before the throne were burning seven torches of fire. So fire is also used of purity. And so what is used here, one or the other or both, uh, both have a lesson to teach us. The church did endure the fiery trials, and they have come through pure uh, because of uh, the work of God in their life. And we identify the context by the phrase, and also those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name, standing beside the sea of glass with hearts of God in their hands. The context is where we were in the last chapter, right there with those elements, the beast, his image, his number. The author here is telling us as we've moved on, we're still dealing with that. Yes, there was a great neuronic persecution. We've discussed that. And as Jim was talking today, the cross looks like the epitome of the defeat of the church. In reality, it's its victory. And so as those tens of thousands were the objects of Nero's hatred and persecution and murder, and the church has been defeated, and yet a few verses later, we see them having transcended to the eternal realm. And there they stand victorious, the dragon having been defeated. And the dragon was in the last chapter, if you remember. The dragon having been defeated. And the apparent defeat of the church, in fact, is really their victory. Did they die? Yes. And that's the way the world looks at You live, you win, you die, you lose. That's just not the way God looked at it. They gave their life and refused to deny the fact and they endured to the end, which they were called to do. He that endures to the end shall be saved. Nothing in the Bible about he that endures a week or two, a month or two, a decade or two. It's like he endures to the end shall be saved. And they did that and sealed their testimony with their life. And now they're singing the song of Moses and the Lamb. That song is a song of victory, as you can imagine. Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. A couple of things here. Twice it talks about the nations. Why is that significant? Well, it's because a nation has been trying to destroy the church of Jesus Christ. The Roman nation. And all of the, you might call, sub-nations that are under their authority. And yet, the Song of Victory makes it clear that he is king of the nations. And that all nations will come to worship you. A prophetic statement to the fact that God is in the business not only of saving souls, but of saving nations. Now, I realize that's a disputed point, and I will, I will handle it as a disputed point. That is, it appears to me that the Great Commission tells us to go into the world, preach the gospel, uh, uh, disciple the nation. And it's always reinterpreted, disciple various people within the nations. They don't even really say that, though. It says the disciple, the nations. And so here, again, prophetically, just a few years later, John follows up on that and says, all nations will come and worship you. This is known as post-millennialism. 
That's why I say I'll handle, I'll handle that uh, as a disputed point. If you're, you know, I'm a millennial or something to that nature. Or historic premillennial. If you're dispensational premillennial, I'll just feel sorry for you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but as one uh, humorous theologian said, the difference between premillennialism and amillennialism, and you have defeat with a millennium and defeat without a millennium. Either way, you've got defeat. Whereas postmillennialists believe that God is intent on discipling the nations, that, that righteousness will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. That is his eschatological intent and purpose. And that's a postmillennial statement. And I say that, giving you room to believe anything you care to think. Yeah, uh, I'm going to be heavy-handed on that point. It just appears to me this is another uh, indication of that. Questions about that? For your righteous acts have been revealed. What righteous acts? This has been a book of uh, horror. This has been a book of disaster and, and, and destruction and pain and death and misery. And we know that God is a loving God who wouldn't do anything like that. Anybody will tell you, just ask them. You know. And yet, the Bible here defines these acts of judgment as righteous acts. And this is what a righteous God does. A loving God wouldn't send anybody to hell through Jehovah's Witness. A loving God did all of this in the book of Revelation. And they were righteous acts because a loving God is a just and righteous God who cannot tolerate in his presence these things. And hell is an eternal testimony to his righteousness and holiness. And so you are so out of sync with Scripture if you believe that God would not do these things. He takes credit for doing these things. They reflect his holiness. And they are a warning to everyone that there's more to come. Questions? I've got to get a different group of people. <laughs> I've got to get a group. You just do such an excellent job, Ralph, that you cover everything. There's no questions left for us to ask. That must be it. That's it. <laughs> After this I looked, and the sanctuary of the tent of witness in heaven was open. That's an unusual phrase. Sanctuary is not, which refers to the temple. They could refer to the temple and, and holy of holies and uh, the holy place, the temple. Uh, or it could refer just to Holy of Holies. It's not clear. But the one thing it does not include is everything outside of that really relatively small box called the temple. Because the temple complex was enormous. Uh, I don't remember how many acres it was. A lot. And remember, this was all given over to the Gentiles, you say. So that's not under discussion. That's designed to, and that's a symbolic place to what was going on here. But from the temple, and this would be the temple, the sanctuary in heaven, it's called the tent of witness. Now witness, when it's used in reference to the uh, tabernacle, the tent, uh, always, without exception, means the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments in Scripture. And so you have uh, in the New Testament, that thing that's so despised by so much of the Church of Jesus Christ that it's depressing. And what is that thing that's so despised? The law. We're not under the law, we're under grace. Now get that law away from us. You know, that attitude by so much of the church. Pretty much, I guess they can do what they want. Is it found in the New Testament? No, well, I don't have to do it then. You say, that it, have you heard that? I've heard it all my life. There's a good reason for that. I grew up in a dispensational church. <laughs> That's the reason I heard it all my life. Uh, I would 
brought to your attention not only the ministry of Christ, which flies in the face of it. It flies in the face of that so much, do you realize that there are plenty of dispensationalists who define the Gospels as Old Testament books? Because they can't deal with that. They can't deal with the Sermon on the Mount, things like that, which are so, uh, you know, ev evidently a reinforcement of the law of God. And so I've heard preachers get up and say, turn to the Old Testament book of Matthew. And I'm not kidding. <laughs> they had no other way to deal with it but to dismiss it into a, another dispensation, which as a whole, they had already dismissed that dispensation. You say. And they would dismiss the book of Revelation into the, in the other direction, in the distant future. Has nothing to do with it. Several thousand years in the future. This was in the past. You get a very denuded Bible in dispensationalism. You know, they feel at liberty to dismiss various parts of it and say that, that for different dispensations. Well, I don't. After this, I looked in the, uh, the sanctuary of the tent of witness, that is, the law of God in heaven was open. And out of the sanctuary came the seven angels with the seven plagues, clothed in pure bright linen with golden sashes around their chests. They, they were uh, clearly dressed up. It struck me that as I read things about angels in heaven over the you know, Old and New Testament, especially the book of Revelation, which has so much of it, you never get any picture of somebody in, uh, uh, you'd have gym shorts in a and a torn sweatshirt, you know. Uh, <laughs> you know. Uh, people, in every sense of the word, they're dressed properly, you say. Uh, it's a really a, a, a formal picture. Uh, and the music is, you know, to some degree, very formal as well. Uh, this is a picture of priestly garb. Whereas uh, the authority coming right from the temple, this isn't something that just happened. And everybody said, what a, wow, what happened there? I didn't see that come. The, the point being made was the orders came from the highest source of authority. They came from the temple. They came from the holy place and the holy of holies. And the angelic emissaries dressed and their formal robes and garments uh, come from that location bearing the, the marching orders uh, from God himself. And one of the four living creatures, now we've been reading about the four living creatures from chapter 4 and the 24 elders, and they constantly actually reappear at different scenes in the scripture. We are in this heavenly court. They remind us we are in the heavenly court of Revelation 4 and 5, we're still in that location where these uh, high officers of heaven continue to interact with John and with the other players on the scene. And, 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 and this heavenly creature, four of them, are the closest creatures described in the, the Bible to God himself. Even the 24 elders are in an outer ring beyond them. This is the, the inner circle of authority. So not only does uh, the orders come from the temple itself, but one of only four in that inner circle bears uh, these uh, plagues and gives them to the angels. So one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven bowls seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God. It lives forever and ever. Now, the, the Caesars come and go, and they die. But this one who claims to be Lord, uh, with authority beyond the lordship of Caesar, this one lives forever and ever. Those that had just gone through the fire, just gone through, uh, I just thought of something. Remember me telling you that, that Nero uh, put on crosses the church of Rome and, and 
doused them and pitched them, put them in his garden for a party and set them on fire. And it just crossed some of my mind here. We have the picture of that sea mingled with fire. As they leave this world in that environment of flame, they step through the veil into eternity and the flames continues to be in their presence, but at this point, harmless. Uh, but bearing testimony to what they just experienced just a few minutes earlier. <clears throat> uh, bowls, golden bowls, were commonly used uh, for uh, temple worship, sacrifice or worship. Uh, you would either fill them with wine and pour them out as drink offerings before God, or you fill them with blood from the animal, and you would cast that blood against the side of the altar. That's how that process takes place. Now we have similar holy instruments from the temple, golden bowls, but this time filled with the place from God himself. And they will be cast to the earth. I would like to draw your attention to a passage in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26, if I may. Hebrews, my thinking, was written one or two or three years before the book of Revelation. And I say that because Hebrews screams uh, um, judgment. Okay, Hebrews 10, verse 26. In fact, if you, when you open the book of Hebrews and start reading it, and uh, Hebrews 1 and then verse 2, but in these last days he has spoken to us by his son. There is a last days theme in the book of Hebrews, and it goes all through the book. Something is going to happen. That's what I think the book of Hebrews reads like. And, uh, and that's why I think he wrote it late. Even John in his epistle says, it is the last hour. He didn't even use days, the latter days. We're beyond the latter days. We're in the last hour. If there's a sense of anticipation of something about to happen. And that characterizes um, the New Testament. Verse 26 chapter 10 of Hebrews. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Now, how many of you have read that over the years and have thought to yourself, uh-oh, I'm rebellious, I'm defiant, I've had my moments when I've harden my heart to the things of God, knowing better and have done things that are wrong. I think you're the only one around. Yeah, I'm the only one. <laughs> you're not going to have a discussion on this one, I can tell you that. <laughs> okay. okay. For, for me, and the one or two out there somewhere <laughs> who have acted in such defiance against God, have you ever read this verse? If we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there is no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. Is that, oh no, I would lose my salvation. You know, you ever had that sick feeling like, you know, I don't have a ch chance. Now, I read John before I got to this one, so therefore it's okay. I want to explain to you something of importance here. But he goes on to say, what a fearful expectation of judgment. A fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. If by now you're panicking. Ah! That's the last thing I wanted to hear. You see? And um, anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy in the evidence. Okay. How much more worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has spurned the Son of God and profaned blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified us and has outraged the spirit of grace. Oh, no, I've outraged the spirit of grace. I've, I've committed the 
unpardonable sin. And people labor over this past, this very passage here, over this question about things like unpardonable sin. And all Christians, basically immature in the faith and the word and the knowledge, this is not a happy passage because they know the defiance of their own heart. But let me explain what this passage refers to. First of all, this is spoken to the nation of Israel, not to individuals. This is spoken to the nation of Israel. Jesus Christ has been given as their sacrifice, the one that paid the price. And they're being told, in no uncertain terms, but if we go on sinning deliberately, sinning deliberately meaning refusing Jesus Christ, after receiving the knowledge of the truth, Jesus Christ being the knowledge of the truth, there is no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. It's not like you've got bulls and goats and Jesus or something else is going to come along. There is nothing going to come along. Jesus Christ is the only sacrifice. And so what do you have if there's no longer remains a sacrifice for sins? Because you have spurned the knowledge of the truth. He's speaking to Israel. It's called the book of Hebrews. That's a hint of his audience. But a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire. We are reading in the book of Revelation about a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire. He is addressing right here in a very brief way exactly what uh, Jesus spoke on in Matthew 24 and John is speaking of through the whole book of Revelation. You can't reject Jesus Christ, he's saying to the nation, without this happening to you and soon. And eternally, too, for that matter. So, I thought that was uh, interesting. It clears up some, some uh, sociological issues. If you were thinking that you're specifically the audience instead of the Hebrew nation the audience, then you'll misunderstand. That brings us back to a point I've said once or twice, one or two hundred times. Make sure you understand the context of which a book has been written. Who is its audience? What are they hearing? And then you can figure out how it applies to you. You say, And if you did that, you wouldn't confuse that passage thinking, I'm going to hell because I defied God. I know I did. See, because you're not. You say, notwithstanding the hardness of your heart. Must be good news, Tom. <laughs> uh, now, back in chapter 15 of the book of Revelation. And the sanctuary was filled with smoke from the glory of God, from his power. And no one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. From time to time, the sanctuary in the Old Testament has been filled with the glory of God. And the priest could not enter to, to minister. Moses could not even enter. Solomon could not enter when the, uh, gl uh, the glory cloud descended upon his new temple. And so this is a picture of a special presence of God. And that, you put it in that context, we're talking about judgment. This, and we like to distance God from things like this, don't we? But God will not be distanced. He defines himself right in the essence of the picture comes from the temple of God, his glory cloud descends. And until these orders are carried out, nothing else is going to happen in this temple because nobody can enter it. It's given prime attention. Questions? This is a transitionary chapter. Uh, there's an interlocking uh, segment here. The author opens up and, uh, and 
he talks about um, the seven plagues that are about to come. And then he readdresses what was in chapter 14. Talks about the beast, the image, the number of his name. And then he goes back and picks up and again talks about that sanctuary and those plagues. That interlocking element where he'll take a, a segment from the last chapter, put it in the middle of the next chapter, and make it seem almost out of place is characteristic of John. And until I figured that out, I was constantly confused by these transitionary chapters. But when you see that, that's clear in this passage, you can see that there is uh, a major change about to take place. And this major change is going to take us right into a new series of plugs.